Good. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, for those of you that don't know, my name is Rebecca. I am the Director of Outreach, Marketing, and Events at Wild Care. I am also our new volunteer coordinator. So I have become quite infamous for saying that I will take your $5, but I will also take your five hours. So if you would like to contribute to Wild Care um, via a donation, you can do that on our website or through our Facebook. Um, and thank you to those of you who donated to this evening's lecture. We are very grateful. Um, also, if you prefer to give us your hours, you can email me and fill out one of our volunteer um, applications right on our website as well. It's right under the tab that says, how can you help? And if you click on that, volunteering is one of our tabs. I will tell you that baby bird season is coming. And while we are getting a little bit full, it's always nice to have a waiting list of folks. So if you'd like to get on that list, please shoot me an email or fill out an application and I will be in touch. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Larry. Larry is an entomologist here um, with the County of Barnstable. We're thrilled to have you with us again this year. Last year's talk was pretty fascinating. I learned an awful lot. So I'm excited to see it again and sort of get a refresher. Mm -hmm. um, Larry is a self-proclaimed entomologist since age five, but subsequently has done all of the educational requirements. <laughs> Um, he leads a lot of talks here on the Cape. We're very excited to have him with us. So without further ado, Larry, it is all yours. Well, thank you, Rebecca. And good evening, everybody. Thanks, thanks for um, coming. And, and I, I, I will tell you that I'm going to feed you a lot of very useful information that um, I hope you'll enjoy and, and utilize, okay? Um, uh, yeah, I've been a bug guy since age five. I knew I was going to be a scientist. Uh, that's that's where I was going, and I didn't stop. Um, I've been with Cooperative Extension now it, pretty much exactly 10 years, okay? And it's been a very eye-opening uh, experience for me. Uh, prior to this, I spent 24 years at Ocean Spray Cranberries, where I was the bug guy for North America. But when my career took a very hard left turn um, from agriculture into public health, um, I was in a brand new world, uh, to be honest. And I mean, I had heard of Lyme disease, but I confess I didn't know a single thing about it. I knew some of my growers had Lyme disease, um, but I didn't know how it was impacting their lives. I mean, it, it just wasn't something that was talked about openly. Um, and so when I started probing this area and trying to find out, okay, what's been done, what, what kind of needs to be done and how the heck am I gonna help pull this off? And as I started looking into this, I, I wanna share with you my very, very first learning um, in this program area. Everyone hates ticks, all right? And this isn't a casual hatred. This is guttural hatred. You say the word tick to a person, and it might remind them of, of when they were a, a kid and kind of the experience of having a tick bite and having their parents remove it. But this, this hatred of ticks um, goes well into adult life, okay? It's carried with us forever. Um, so Lyme is not something that popped up in Lyme, Connecticut uh, 40 plus years ago. Uh, it's not a new disease, although there are conspiracy theories about, you know, how this started at a, at a lab on Plum Island and then spread out. Uh, it's not a new disease at all. And in, in fact, it's a re-emerging disease. And we'll talk about the ecological reasons for that um, a little bit later. But that Lyme disease bacteria, genetically, we know it's been on the planet for about 100,000 years, all right? So it's been around for a while. And, and Lyme is endemic in over 60 countries around the world. So it's certainly endemic throughout North America, um, it parts of South America. It is a big up and coming problem in Europe. Um, and they're, they're still trying to figure out how do they get this genie back in the bottle because they don't, they don't have a lot of um, knowledge of what to do with it. And then certainly down in Southeast Asia. So this, this 
thing is everywhere. Now, if you ever felt like we were living at ground zero here on Cape Cod, well, it's because we are, all right? If you look at the United States, all six New England states have the highest incidence rates of Lyme disease in the country, okay? Uh, so we are certainly at the center of this problem. Now let's look at the different players we have. Um, I can't see the audience, um, but I, I, will, I will assume that a few of you are baby boomers like myself. And for us baby boomers, uh, tick identification was easy. Um, the good old American dog tick, that was the only tick we had when we were growing up. And I consider this really more annoying than a public health threat per se. It can vector the pathogens that cause Rocky Mountain spotted fever and tularemia. And those are quite serious diseases. But um, this far north, they are, they are very, very uncommon. Um, Lone Star tick. Yeah, this is the new tick in town. And it doesn't get its name Lone Star because it's from Texas, although it does occur down in that area. But that adult female has that bright white spot on her back. And this is a very, very different tick. And it's been moving north steadily for a number of years. A number of ecologists think that this is, a, this is another sign of climate change. You know, that fake news stuff? Well, the fact is the earth is getting warmer and we are seeing plants and animals in places we never used to see them before. And up until about 10 or 12 years ago, the northernmost established points that we knew of were on the islands of Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. Well, shortly after I was hired, um, I was called out to Sandy Neck Beach Park in West Barnstable. And that's a six mile long peninsula. And the park staff told me they were seeing a tick that they didn't recognize it. They weren't deer ticks and they weren't dog ticks. And I went sampling in that area and I found Lone Star tick from one end of that place to the other. They own that piece of real estate. And then a, a couple of years later, um, I found another well-established population along the Shining Sea bike trail in Falmouth. So what, what I'm pretty confident has happened is that Sandy Neck Beach Park is a perfect flyway for migrating birds. And it's easy to think about birds stopping off on one of the islands, picking up a few Lone Star ticks, stopping off in Sandy Neck, ticks drop off, lay some eggs, boom, off we go. Well, that bike trail, that's not a flyway for migratory birds. So what I'm convinced has happened is that once it got established in Sandy Neck, um, there are animals on the ground that are moving these ticks around. Ticks are fantastic hitchhikers. And so to get a sense of the animal activity in the area on the bike trail, I put out some trail cameras, kind of see what's, what's going on out there. And this is the bike trail. This grassy area is where we found the Lone Star ticks. And yeah, I'd see this big flock of wild turkeys moving north one morning and a few days later they'd become marching south and when they were first describing the lone star tick they almost named it the turkey tick because that's a preferred host um yeah a lot of rabbits in the area and i was talking to a hunter um in that region and he told me that when he takes a bunny the ears are just loaded with lone star ticks um, I was curious about wild canids that have pretty good territorial ranges. Yeah, a lot of coyotes in that area, okay? Certainly another candidate for tick dispersal. And a very dapper Bigfoot out for a morning stroll. And this is one of the reasons I became a scientist because you go out looking for data, you don't know what the heck you're gonna find. Um, this tick is very different than what we're accustomed to. Uh, these creatures are aggressive. And what I mean by that is they have really good vision and they can run with the speed of a spider. They are fast. And I've seen this in action. So if they see you from 20 feet away, say, they're going to come rolling at you like a little race car. Now, the adult female Lone Star ticks, like other ticks, 
she lays her eggs in a mass and that egg mass might contain four or 5,000 eggs. And they hatch out um, late summer, August into September. And they hatch into these tiny, tiny larvae that are less than a millimeter long. And so with these clusters of eggs, you end up with these very high concentrations of these larval lone star ticks. So if you're walking along and you bump into one, generally you're gonna meet most of the family in a hurry. And with this aggressive behavior, you can get two or 300 bites before you even know it. And while the tick larvae don't transmit disease, uh, those bites will burn and itch for a good four to six weeks, even with getting treatment like something like cortisone. And they don't transmit the bug that causes Lyme. They've got their own unique diseases. Um, ehrlichiosis and tularemia, yeah, those can be very, very serious. Um, Starry is a type of rash disease with flu-like symptoms, pretty easy to diagnose and cure. Of the ticks that we've had tested, we've only found the pathogen uh, Starry. Um, and I know Cape Cod Hospital has diagnosed and treated people for Starry. So those other pathogens, we haven't found them yet in the tick population, but it's a matter of time before they, they show up. But the real game changer here is that the bite of a lone star tick can trigger an allergy to red meat consumption. And this allergic response can be as mild as hives, uh, but all the way to anaphylactic shock. Yeah, you're in the hospital, you can't breathe, um, you need fast treatment. And I know um, Cape Cod Hospital has treated people um, for this red meat allergy. And it's not just beef, but it's pork, lamb, and even beef byproducts like beef derived gelatin, which is represented in a lot of processed foods. And I've recently learned that uh, this allergic response can even be triggered by um, high fat dairy products like ice cream. Who can imagine living in a world without ice cream? I personally cannot. All right, this is still the most important tick on the landscape right now. We, we all call it the deer tick, but the, the real accurate name for this tick is the black-legged tick, and we'll get into the reasons for that um, in a minute. Now, um, deer ticks aren't like lone star ticks. They don't come chasing you. In fact, deer, deer ticks are blind, so they're an ambush predator. They have to wait for dinner to come to them. And they have this behavior called questing. And so here's an adult um, female deer tick on top of that twig. And you can see she's got her front legs stretched up in the air, like she's signaling a New England Patriots touchdown. Um, well, she's not. Um, as it turns out, her nose is on her front legs and ticks have a phenomenal sense of smell. And one of the things ticks can smell uh, like mosquitoes, is carbon dioxide. So if you're in an area and you're breathing regularly, you're changing the concentration of carbon dioxide around you, and the tick can sense that. It, it, it can detect changes in temperature, like body heat. So the closer you get to it, it knows something's going on, and they can detect vibration. So while that tick cannot see you, it's got a lot of information flowing in from a certain direction, and it's gonna orient itself and wave those front legs until you get close enough uh, to hopefully touch it, because at the end of those legs is this beautiful little claw. And the minute you touch it, it will attach, and then it's gonna start climbing and looking for a place to settle down and have dinner. So let's look at the hardware for a second. This is a deer tick head under a microscope. And those projections on either side of the tick's head, those are called palps. That's what the tick uses to taste you and see if you taste interesting enough to become dinner. If you are chosen to be a dinner partner, takes these things here. These are called chelicerae. They're like little scalpel blades with hooks. And what that tick does, it makes an incision, hooks in, and pulls, and it does this 
over and over. It's kind of like doing the breaststroke in swimming. And with each pull, it's driving that beak of a mouth part down deeper and deeper into your skin. And if we look at that for a second under a microscope, yeah, that's pretty formidable hardware. It's fairly long and it's got those nice recurved barbs, okay, like little fish hooks. So if you were ever trying to remove a tick and felt like you were ripping out your flesh, it's because you are. And, and ticks, they, they're not like a five to 10 second feeder like a mosquito. Um, they set up shop and from start of feeding to finish, uh, that tick may be attached to you for five days, okay? And the tick doesn't start sucking blood the minute it attaches. The first thing a tick does, it injects you with tick spit, okay? They got no social graces at all. And to a science geek like myself, tick spit is absolutely fascinating. It's got all kinds of chemicals in it. And one of the things in tick spit is glue. So it's got the barbs, but it actually cements itself in place. And tick spit contains anticoagulants that keeps your blood from clotting. Um, vasodilators, that'll increase the flow of blood to the point of attachment. And things to anesthetize your nerves. That tick wants to be undetected while it goes about its business. So it, it goes through cycles of sucking blood and spitting and sucking blood and spitting. And when it's done, it'll it'll secrete an enzyme, dissolve that glue, uh, back itself out, and, and may have left you with a few um, microbial presents. All right, why the name deer tick is a misnomer. This tick has been documented to be associated with 125 different vertebrate hosts. So it's not just about deer, it's not just about mice. Uh, it's a complex ecosystem and there's a lot of moving parts. Um, rodents are, are absolutely key in this ecosystem. Uh, things like mice and chipmunks and rats, um, they're what we call competent hosts. And what I mean by host competency is that these creatures have the ability to harbor that Lyme disease bacteria and transmit it back into the tick population. So it's kind of like microbial ping pong. Uh, birds play a role, a couple different ways. We already know birds are um, agents of dispersal. They carry ticks around and, and help them uh, distribute themselves. But there are some birds that are competent hosts for that Lyme disease bacteria. Uh, songbirds like our American robin, uh, but also our, our friend, the wild turkey, which we seem to have a, an abundance here on Cape Cod. And then we've got a whole lot of creatures that are incompetent. These are animals that cannot infect the tick. They, they cannot carry that bacteria. So deer don't infect ticks, raccoons. So they, but, but what these creatures can do is supply a blood meal and help that tick population keep rolling along. All right, the risk of infection is year round. And we'll look at some data in a minute to support that. Uh, but the greatest risk isn't where you might think it is based on the data. It's not from these adult stage ticks. Uh, they started coming out last late September and they're with us now. And uh, they'll, they'll be vanishing fairly quickly. And in our surveillance research, we find that 50% um, of them are packing that bug that causes Lyme disease. The greatest risk is from these nymph stage ticks and, and they're just appearing right now and they'll be with us into August. <clears throat> and, and only about 20% of them are infected, but that's a much smaller stage of the tick and that's more likely to elude a tick check, okay? So we had a large stage of the tick and a small stage. And so as we were thinking, how do we talk about this to people in a way um, so that you can gauge the size and, and develop a, a, a search image, okay, when you're doing your tick checks. And we found out that bagel toppings cooperate beautifully in this regard. An adult stage tick is the size of, of a sesame seed. And even with my feeble vision at my age, 
I can see a sesame seed. But those nymph stage ticks, they're the size of a poppy seed. So something that small with eight legs, a real bad attitude that can plant you on your butt for a very, very long time. And we see this in the case data. So yeah, um, we see cases of Lyme disease every single month of the year. So even during the winter, um, when temperatures are above freezing, and this, this surprises people uh, that call me, Larry, it's January, um, why didn't the cold weather kill off the ticks? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. So we can see cases of Lyme disease in January, February, and March, and uh, in late fall into December. But during the summer months, when that nymph stage of the tick is out there, that stage of the tick is responsible for 85% of all tick-borne diseases. So we need to be vigilant year-round, but really have to be on our game during the summer months. And not everybody's impacted equally, all right? This is Lyme disease by age group. So over on the far left, uh, kids under the age of 10 have the highest incidence rate of Lyme disease in the state. So my message to parents is that these data show that everything we've been doing up to this point in time is not working. We gotta rethink the game plan about how we can better protect our children. And some of the recommendations I'm going to make, might people might not be comfortable with it, but they're gonna be safe and effective recommendations, guaranteed. And you see the incidence rate for people in their 20s and 30s is, is much lower. Um, people are starting families, they're starting careers. There's not as much outdoor activity time, at least in tick habitat. And as we get older, there's, there's two things happening. Um, there, there's more leisure time. So for things like um, gardening and golf, um, but our immune system is also uh, playing the back nine, so to speak, for you golf aficionados. Uh, so we're much more susceptible to these diseases. So we see another peak. And there are two other emerging diseases. Um, uh, the top chart in blue, that's babesiosis. And this is kind of like getting malaria. This disease can be directly fatal. And, and for babesiosis, it's, it's not commonly found in younger people, but 95% of the cases are for people in age 60 and older. Uh, the bottom chart is anaplasmosis, also can be quite a serious disease. Again, younger people are not as impacted. Uh, and again, older people are, are the ones that are most susceptible. And if we look at the demographics, of Cape Cod. Um, the median age of the Massachusetts population is 39. So that means that 50% of the people in Massachusetts are older than 39, 50% are younger. If you look at the Cape, we have two towns um, on the outer Cape that have a median age of 60. Um, most of the other towns are in their, you know, median age 50s. I mean, Bourne is the youngest town in the Cape. Then again, it's, it's median age of 46. So from my standpoint, um, we have a very susceptible population that, that I really have to focus on. So that's why doing this type of presentations at senior centers and libraries and garden clubs and, and venues like this, it's really important for me to get the word out to the older population. Winters, people are surprised that they can be out in the middle of the winter and get a tick bite. And, and people call me and say, Larry, we've had a brutal winter. Why didn't this kill the ticks? We had nights where it was in the teens or even a few nights in the single digits. Um, what's going on here? Well, it's a matter of perspective. Um, are the winters on Cape Cod all that harsh? Not from my standpoint. When I worked for Ocean Spray, I spent 24 years traveling Wisconsin, where I went by the name Sven, okay? Wisconsin has real winters. 25 below zero for extended periods of time. It's not unusual out there. 
And in Wisconsin, deer tick populations are very, very healthy. And Wisconsin is quite endemic for Lyme disease. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me get a drink of water here. It also explains why Wisconsin has the highest per capita consumption of brandy in the country, okay? Those people are warriors. <laughs> they, they will survive anything. I, I love them to death. All right, the reason for this is that ticks do a little trick. They make a chemical called glycerol. Well, what the heck is glycerol? These guys figured out how to make antifreeze. And the way this works is that glycerol prevents ice crystal formation in cells. Because if you get an ice crystal in a cell, it's going to puncture the cell wall and everything's going to leak out. And that's not bad for the, that's not good for the organism. But they made another discovery. That bacteria uses the back glycerol as its principal energy source. So this is a perfectly engineered little package. I just think it's totally fascinating. So questions I get is, Larry, Lyme disease was not a problem when I was a kid. What, what, what has happened? And this is me thinking about that question, all right? Well, people look at this as that you look at the deer population and, and if you look at those ears of that, that doe, each of those red blobs is a fully engorged tick. So the, the deer can supply a lot of potential for the size of the population, but that's not in total how this game works. Um, I've got a colleague in New York at the Cary Institute, Rick Ostfeld, and he shared some data with me, a 14 year study. And he looked on that bottom horizontal axis, he looked at the density of deer in the fall. And then on that vertical axis, he looked at the density of nymph stage ticks two years later, because there's a lag time in the life cycle. And if, if the density of deer was a good predictor of the density of the tick population, those data points would line up in a straight line from the lower left to the upper right, but they don't. They don't, That's uh, it, it's like shotgun scatter. And if you look at that statistic in the upper right, R squared, 0 0.007, the density of deer is completely um, not correlated with the density of ticks. And we have data that we generated here on the Cape and the islands that basically uh, show the same thing. All right, one of the things we've been doing over the last 60 years, even, even longer, is we've been cutting down a lot of trees, all right? And yeah, we're, we're making room for all these nice sprawling suburban neighborhoods. And, and so, so people were moving out of the, you know, the cities, moving more into the, the town, uh, neighboring towns and creating these suburban neighborhoods. But in the process of creating this habitat, we didn't just cut down trees. We have fragmented the forest into patches and when we do this, as we get to a smaller and smaller patch size, we reduce biological diversity. And at some point, you start losing your top tier predators, like fox. Fox are the most efficient predators of reservoir hosts, like mice and chipmunks and voles. And so what we've done is we've just left this landscape entirely open for the infected reservoir host population. So we, we really did this to ourselves through land use management patterns. And we can't unring a bell. There's no way we're gonna restore back to, you know, what the old Cape was, but we just have to be mindful that we created this environment. And this is what we have to be prepared to deal with going forward into the future. All right. We talk about our program in a three-phase plan, protect yourself, protect your yard, and protect your pets. And the way my job description should have been written is to take business away from doctors and hospitals by whatever means necessary. So in a sense, I'm in the family protection racket, and I enjoy that a lot. 
So here's an average family on Cape Cod. Okay. This is obviously Woods Hole, if you've ever been down there. And they certainly need protection from tick-borne diseases as well as from themselves. All right, the boilerplate recommendations. Long pants, preferably suck, tucked into socks. It's effective. In the 10 years I've been working on the Cape, I see Cape Codders making a lot of bold fashion statements, but you guys are not making this one, at least as far as I can see. Um, wearing light colors makes perfect sense makes it easier to see the ticks. I tell people when you come in from an outdoor activity, throw your clothes in the dryer for 20 minutes. That's all it takes to kill any ticks that are, that are attached. And real shoes, okay? This is not footwear for going out into tick habitat, okay? Guaranteed. Um, in the event that you do get a tick bite, um, proper removal. And I, I have a lot of people call me about, you know, getting advice on tick removal. And they all, a number of people have their own idea. They just want me to validate it. Like, Larry, I heard, I read on Facebook that if you put dish detergent on it and just wipe it away, or Vaseline, or, or I don't know who invented the flaming match trick. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. But pointy tweezers is, is really the name of the game. So you just simply grab that tick by the head as close to your skin as you can get. And you just gently pry straight up. Now, in the event you see something left behind, okay, that's when uh, it's 911 call Larry. People are in a complete panic because they will tell me immediately the head's embedded in there. Um, do they have to go to the ER and get it surgically removed? Well, the tick can't physically get their heads into you. Uh, that beak of the mouth part, that's the only thing that remains behind. And that's just like a soda straw with, with hooks. It's, it doesn't cause infection. So you just hit it with a little neosporin and it's gonna dissolve a few, few years, you know, a few days later. It's like a, no worse than a wood splinter. Um, I tell people to record the date of a tick bite um, because something like Lyme disease, the symptoms might show up in three days, but it could take a week, could take a couple weeks, might take a month, all right? So if you record the date and now you're, you're, you're not feeling like yourself and you're gonna have a conversation with your primary, at least you got a reference point to start that conversation. I tell people to save the tick. Don't, don't flush that down the drain. Uh, that's evidence, okay? Because like with our research ticks, you can send that um, tick to a lab at UMass Amherst, uh, tickreport.com. And once they get that tick, uh, you're gonna get a report back to you in three business days or less. It's a phenomenal lab. And unlike the human blood test for Lyme, this test is 99.9% .9 accurate, okay? Now, they have a database of um, every tick that they analyze goes into a searchable database. So you can plug in your zip code, and it's going to pull up all the tick reports for your neighborhood, kind of see what's going on. And I pulled a couple examples of tick reports to kind of illustrate a few points. Um, Here's a tick that came off the head of a three-year-old boy up in Norwell. And this, they send you back pictures and this tick was fully engorged, meaning this tick was on the kid's head for probably five days. Plenty of time for transmission to occur. Now for transmission, we've got a 24 hour rule of thumb. If the tick is on you for less than 24 hours, the risk of transmission is low. It's not zero, but it's low. And after 24 hours, and especially after 48 hours, the risk of transmission ramps up pretty quickly. So this tick tested positive up top for Borrelia burgdorferi. That's the agent that causes Lyme disease. And so without medical intervention, this little boy would have come down with Lyme disease but that tick was co-infected. And, and this is a point we're trying to get across to the general public and the medical community in that a number of ticks are packing more than one pathogen and you can get more than one of these 
diseases at the same time. Now, we already know that babesiosis is very uncommon in younger people, but, but for the patient, these are hard data. This irrefutable data that you can show your physician that I was potentially exposed to this and I was potentially exposed to this. For a physician, um, they can look at these data and then look at you and try and figure out, okay, what is the clinical presentation that's going to help me put you into the right course of, of treatment? Here's one that's um, basically from your neighborhood. Um, this is a 63-year-old woman in East Ham, and her tick hit the lottery. That tick was positive for everything we were interested in, and that tick was partially fed. So we don't know the patient outcomes of this, but, but think about how complex the clinical presentation of that tick might be um, if the doctor didn't have access to these data. So we think it's a great service and, and people should avail themselves of, of using the lab. It's been, it was closed since last fall. Um, the university furloughed all its employees, but that lab um, reopened for business last week. Now, I talk about repellents with people as a first-line defense, and repellents come in a few different flavors. So you get this group up top. So you get the DEET products or the DEET alternatives like picaridin or oil of lemon eucalyptus, and these are for treating exposed skin. And so with a skin repellent, it means the tick won't bite you where the repellent is, but that tick might just keep walking around until it finds a place where there's no repellent. So you got to use them uh, wisely. Then you got this group on the bottom, uh, the group of products I absolutely hate, the all natural products. And when something says it's all natural, re repellent for ticks and mosquitoes, um, parents in particular, it resonates with them that they think they're using something safe and effective on their children. And nothing could be further from the troop, truth. The difference between these two groups is the group up top, those are EPA registered products. So if the label says it repels ticks for six hours, there are data on file at EPA to support that claim. These all natural products, they are EPA registration exempt, meaning they don't have to supply a single shred of evidence that they work at all. They are completely fraudulent. And I wish the Federal Trade Commission would take action on these products like they're doing with fraudulent mosquito products and fraudulent bed bug products. Hopefully these things will, will be taken off the market at some point. Um, you can also get a repellent for treating clothing, uh, the active ingredients permethrin. So that's for treating like your pants. This is a picture from my sock drawer. I like to play superhero day in the office some days and for treating shoes. And it keeps its activity through six washings or, or 45 days. And uh, what I found when I was first doing research with this product, it just doesn't repel ticks. I found if a tick is exposed to a treated surface for 60 seconds, that tick is guaranteed to die, all right? A death might occur in five minutes, might take 10 minutes, little bit longer, but, but the outcome is, is not, um, uh, the tick can't escape that outcome. And I tell people that treating footwear is really important. Those nymph stage ticks that cause 85% of all our problems, they're down in the leaf litter. The first place they attach to are your shoes. So I tell people, treat your shoes every four weeks. And so I recommend people put this in there um, cell phones a, as a reoccurring appointment. So, you know, four weeks later, yeah, time to treat my footwear. There's a number of different formulations. Uh, this is Sawyer. It's a water-based pump spray. Um, most of the other products are aerosol products. Um, they're all equivalent. They all contain one half percent permethrin. The biggest problem when I found out how effective this was is that you, you couldn't find product. And so I met with the managers or owners of all the major garden centers on the Cape, and I convinced them to stock product. 
And in the last few years, when I go into a garden center and I see, okay, we've got product on shelf, how are sales? And they tell me they're out of stock more than in stock. It's flying off the shelf. So the word is getting out there. You can also buy pre-treated clothing. Uh, Insect Shield invented this technology um, 20, 25 years ago. And, um, and you can buy clothing from Insect Shield, but they also market it through other brands like Orvis or Ex Officio. Um, in the last few years, up on the upper right, there's a, a small company that popped up in Maine, uh, No Fly Zone. Similar technology, um, but the same bottom line, keeps its activity through 70 washings or 10 years, basically the life of the garment. And you can also send your clothing to Insect Shield. They'll treat them and send them back to you in a couple of weeks with the 70 washings claim. And it's not expensive. It's, it's about 10 bucks a garment. So it's a, it's a pretty good way. So there's, there's three different ways you can skin this cat. All right, the elephant in the room slide. Um, particularly if I have parents in the audience and they're looking at me like I'm absolutely lost my mind. They're saying, Larry, you're telling me to put my kids in clothing treated with a synthetic chemical pesticide. And I nod my head. Yep, I'm absolutely telling you that. Because remember back in that earlier slide, kids under the age of 10 have the highest incidence rate of Lyme in the state. We got to rethink our game plan. So I tell people that this is a psychological barrier. This is not about toxicity. Um, in, in, in basic tenet of modern toxicology, it's, it's not the molecule that makes the poison, it's the dose that makes the poison, how much you were exposed to and how, how were you exposed? Was it dermal, was it oral, was it inhalation? And if you do the arithmetic, permethrin's over 2000 times more toxic to a tick than a person. People are big, ticks a little, it does not take a whole lot to knock them down. Um, EPA did establish a position uh, that reasonable certainty, because that's what they have to do, that permethrin treated clothing poses no harm to infants, children, pregnant women, and then they extended that to nursing mothers. And their um, criteria certainly would be conservative. And the reason for this is that products like permethrin, uh, this class of insecticides, they have low dermal absorption and whatever small amounts absorbed uh, is metabolized within a couple hours. National Research Council, that is a heavyweight operation. And they raised the question that, you know, this technology was originally developed for the military. And so they were wondering about what are the implications here, long-term exposure. So in their evaluation, they were looking at people wearing permethrin treated everything, head to toe, 18 hours a day, every single day for 10 years. And when they rolled up that aggregate exposure, they saw no reason to expect an adverse effect. And finally, the last thing I point out to people, uh, permethrin is the active ingredient that you would slather on an infant for scabies mite at a much higher concentration. And it's the active ingredient that's used to treat head lice, which is making a comeback in our school systems. So from my standpoint, what I look at is a relatively low risk exposure cup. And I weigh that against the consequences of one of these tick-borne diseases. For me, that is easy, easy math. All right, tick habitat. I pulled this off the CDC website and it's accurate. Um, they basically say, you know, in the middle of the trail, you're not going to find deer ticks there, but you go into surrounding vegetation. Yeah, that's where the ticks are. Same with, with grassy fields. But these pictures are a little bit misleading because it implies you have to go to a place like National Seashore or, or Nickerson State Park to get a tick bite. And that's not the case. Surveillance work in Connecticut showed that two thirds of the people that submitted ticks for identification and testing got them from their own backyards. 
all right? So ticks and gardening, yeah, the perfect marriage. So you're not going to find deer ticks out in the middle of an open lawn, um, short grass, direct sunlight, high temperatures, low humidity. Deer ticks can't survive that. But we do know that lone stars um, can venture out into those more open areas. And as they become more abundant, we have to think about, okay, what's our yard management strategy look like? But you go to the edge of the yard that might be in partial shade and it transitions into brush and leaf litter, shade trees. So cooler temperatures, higher humidity, that's where you're going to find the ticks. But if you think about those ornamental plantings at the edge, you know, next to your house and along your sidewalk, yeah, that's, that's tick habitat as well. So as a one-two punch strategy, I am an advocate of perimeter yard sprays. So there are, there are companies on the Cape that do this um, as a service. And there's a number of them out there. Uh, I tell people at buyer beware because a number of these companies are looking to sell you a, an all natural solution, uh, the green solution. And really good research at the University of Rhode Island shows those botanical oil-based products have absolutely no impact on deer ticks. Okay, you might as well be spraying water and spraying a lot of, and, and spending a lot of money. <clears throat> you can also do this yourself. You can go to a garden center, get a hose end sprayer, save a lot of money. We have a, a demonstration video on our website uh, that shows you the ins and outs of how to do this. And there are some developments that are interesting right now. Uh, we all know the, the name Pfizer by now, but they've partnered, partnered with Valneva. And they have a candidate vaccine in phase two clinical trials that just started. And it, they're, they're using adults as well as children as part of this study. And this is the only vaccine that's in any degree of physical trials. Okay, so uh, we'll see where this comes out. It might take you know a year or so to figure out, okay, is it working or not working? Uh, this got a lot of press. Uh, it's being called a vaccine, but that's, that's not true. It's um, a technology called monoclonal antibodies. And with this product, um, it will prevent you from getting the infection and when you get treated with this product, uh, it, it will protect you for a period of eight months. And this is also in phase two clinical trials. And finally, pet protection. Yeah, this is my OG slide. Rebecca, you like it? Um, tick checks, yeah, if you have animals going outdoors, uh, certainly it's important to give them a look over. Uh, pooches are very, very susceptible to Lyme disease, but so are horses and goats. Uh, cats, on the other hand, it, it's, it's actually hard to infect them with Lyme disease, even in a laboratory. Um, there's a number of over-the-counter products that are available to people. Um, recent, in the recent years, um, uh, the canine Advantix 2 type products the, that are monthly topicals, uh, Ceresto uh, collar came on the market and you put that on your pooch and you get eight months of continuous flea and tick control. And I've talked to hundreds of dog owners that have, that have swapped over that product and all but two are very happy with it. The two that, that took the product off um, there was a skin irritation issue with, with the dogs. Um, I recommend people, before you embark on a program for your pet, talk to your veterinarian, okay? Because based on the age of the pet, um, whether it's pregnant, whether it's nursing, those all may um, make a difference in the, in the most appropriate way to approach pet protection. And Insect Shield, they were not to be denied a marketing opportunity. They came out with a line of permethrin treated neck gaiters and vests. Um, and so that vest, um, I obtained one of those and I've got a colleague in my office and she walks her dog in Nickerson State Park every night and the dog picks up lots and lots of ticks. So I gave this vest to her, kind of just test it out. And she came back to me and told me, uh, her dog is tick-free. It works like a charm. 
Um, not everybody can attend my, my workshops based on schedules. So I received a grant from Cape Cod Healthcare and I spent six months in studio uh, scripting and producing 10 YouTube videos on every possible angle of, of um, protection. So I've got one on Lone Star Tick, one on perimeter yard sprays, how to apply permethrin to your clothing. Uh, and these videos have made their way outside of Barnstable County. In fact, these videos found their way all the way to Australia for a um, patient advocacy group, which is, is pretty cool. So I get phone calls periodically. Good eye, mate. How are you doing? Uh, so it's a it's a great series, and uh, I I strongly recommend giving it a view. So what we've done is we've simplified the game plan. Uh, I saw there's a number of extension programs where it's a list of eight to ten things to do. And a number of those recommendations, they don't have any data to support, support it. And our program is evidence-based science. So if, if I'm looking at a recommendation I'm making and I can't find data to support that, it's not on our list. So in ours, it's a three-point plan. Uh, tick checks and use of permethrin-treated clothing. You do that alone. You've reduced the chances of getting a tick bite by 90%. You couple that with a perimeter yard spray, further reduce exposure risk and pet protection. So while these tick-borne diseases can be um, life-altering or, or life-threatening, the silver lining here is, is that there are things we can do to protect ourselves. It's just a matter of implementation. So with that, uh, we can open this up uh, Rebecca, and take any questions that people may have. Yes, I have a couple, um, and I'm just going to add to your phone reminder. I spray my shoes on the same day that I do my 30 day tick and flea and tick and ear mite prevention. Yep. Um, for my guys, so if that helps people, I tend to put it in my phone as the same all the same day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. So I do have a couple of questions. Does the DEET and similar products work on all types of ticks, even the crazy speedy Lone Star tick? Yes, uh, it has um, activity across the class of ticks that we would be exposed to. Okay, um, for, for the yard treatment, is the pesticide selective or are there beneficial insects and other animals that would be susceptible to harm from yard spray? Yeah, I, I do feel that question quite a bit because people are concerned about, you know, non-target effects, um, principally pollinators and, and other beneficials. Well, I, I don't see bees foraging in leaf litter, so I think we can, and, and if you do these sprays in the late in the afternoon or early in the morning when bees aren't out in the field, you, you reduce any exposure risk. There are creatures that live in the leaf litter, um, springtails. You might have 20,000 of those per square foot and they are part of mother nature's recycling committee. So they take um, decaying organic matter and return nutrients to the soil. So you will get a knockdown of those populations. But, but these pesticides degrade in a period of like three weeks and, and creatures like springtails, they will repopulate an area very, very quickly. So, so there's a very short term effect. So this is not like um, Rachel Carson silent spring sort of picture. Uh, so I think you can use these products safely. The other thing I like about products like permethrin in the landscape is that once they hit uh, organic matter and soil particles, they're immobilized, okay? And permethrin's not that water soluble. So it's there's no risk of leaching the groundwater. And I know everybody is really uh, mindful of a single source aquifer here on the Cape. And they're not gonna wash off site into any adjacent uh, wetlands that you might be next to. So the chemical properties for for us are actually quite ideal. Um, Tara, I hope that answered your question. Um, if now is nymph season, 
how does one explain the presence of larger ticks? We've pulled off larger sizes. They're sort of the size of a peppercorn. Yeah, the, the adult stage deer ticks are still out there, um, but they're gonna, they're gonna, um, uh, those populations are gonna disappear because they're, they're running out of gas, so to speak. They've been active since last October. And, and un, unless they get a blood meal, they will eventually just die of starvation. So yeah, they're still out there right now. And you're probably going to see the, the adult stage six for another uh, probably 10 days. Are turkeys good tick eaters? Um, it's a great question. And that comes up all the time. I've got chickens, I've got turkeys, I've got... You know, I've read about guinea fowl, and and again, my colleague Rick Osfeld at the Cary Institute, he put a he put a student on this project, and uh, what she found was that um, birds like guinea fowl and turkeys, they can find those adult stage ticks that are up on vegetation, say eighteen inches off the ground, but those nymph stage ticks, they cannot find them to save their lives. Hmm. So I guess the answer is sort of. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it, 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 I don't think it's regulating populations to any great extent. So, so yeah, if you like having turkeys or chickens around, I think that's a good thing. Um, but it, it's, it's not going to replace a perimeter yard spray. Um, who are ticks predators and should people reconsider bird feeders? I was dragged into a conversation or discussion thread on Facebook last week about bird feeders. And uh, people were saying, you know, you shouldn't have bird feeders in the yard because you're just going to attract mice and you're going to increase tick populations. And, and I weighed in and, and said, no, bird feeders have zero impact on tick populations. And that discussion thread went on for like 50 or 60 comments that Larry, you're out of your mind. That, that can't be true. But, but again, uh, Rick Ostfeld has done the research. He, he did um, surveillance of like several hundred households, those that had bird feeders and those that don't. And he saw no, no material difference in tick populations. So feed your birds. Good news for us, because it's yeah. just about migratory bird season. So put out your feeders and make sure you've made your windows safe for all of our uh, all of our new visitors. <laughs> yeah, so we'll put up the feeders. Um, but there there was a lot of people that just totally disagreed with me. They just, Larry, you're you're wrong. You're, you're absolutely <laughs> wrong. And I say, well, here's the research. Um, poke some holes in it. Well, I like that research. Um, Cheryl is curious if you know, are oral flea and tick medications for dogs as effective as the others? Yes. So things like a next card, I think is what you're talking about. Yeah, those are effective products. Um, and how long before you wear a piece of clothing do you put the um, permethrin on? Once it's dry. So you, you treat clothing outdoors. So you put your, your footwear on the deck, put your uh, pants and socks over a, a porch rail. You spray it until it's visibly damp. And then you just let it air dry for a couple hours and then you're good to go. Um, let's see. Can you comment on Lyme tests or direct us to a trusted resource for information? Um, some people have an understanding that some of these can be unreliable. So do you have a source that you find? No, I'm, I'm, I don't, that's, that's medicine. That's, and I'm not a doctor and the county doesn't want Larry practicing medicine without a license. So I know, I know that the, the test is unreliable. Um, you can have false positives and you can have false negatives. Uh, so a more accurate diagnostic tool is sorely needed. Um, so I wouldn't say there's anything out there to suggest that one is better than another, but, but again, it's, um, 
That's a doctor question. See, I'm not a doctor. Pardon? All the more reason to keep the tick and send it to, I'm sorry, what was the resource that you gave us? Tickreport.com at UMass. All right. I'm going to add that. Very engaged group. This, is, yeah, this has been great. Anyone needs it. All right, let's see. I think that is everything. A lot of people are saying, thank you, Larry. This is incredibly informative, really helpful. People have gone from scared um, and now they're feeling confident and hopeful. So thank you so much. I think people are gonna get outside with a little bit more confidence this spring. I know I certainly am going to. Thank you so much for your support of Wild Care. Thank you for this. So we are hoping that we're gonna be able to do some in-person things later this year or into 2022. Oh. Yeah, and we've yeah, already Larry has already a couple graciously of, uh, said he will join us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've already talked about a, a couple other workshop topics that I do that we can cover, like on pollinators or, or some other things. Uh, so happy to be working with you. Thank you. We are as well. So for those of you that joined us, uh, you can join us for a couple more weeks. We're going to be doing uh, wonderful wild Wednesdays um, throughout the spring. This has also been recorded. We'll be adding it to our YouTube channel. So if you have questions, as always, you can contact me and I can field your questions to Larry or his information is at the beginning of this presentation and you can find it on Wild Care's YouTube channel. So thank you so much again, Larry. Thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday night and we will see you you next week. Good night. Excellent. Bye -bye. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.